Welcome back. You're listening to Cross the Border. It's our Prophecy Reality Edition. And we're going to take this segment and we're going to continue in our book uh, reviewing uh, History Unveiling Prophecy. And this is the picture of the cover here. Our Time as Interpreter by H. Grattan Guineas. Now, uh, we're republishing this book soon, but there's a PDF in your uh, uh, link to the PDF in the chat room in case you're interested in following along. And if you're not in the chat room live and you'd like a copy of that, just uh, contact me. Go to my website, crosstheborder.org, and uh, contact me there. Or if you uh, go to the free ebook tab there and first sign up for my blog and share it, share that free book tab there, and then uh, ask for a copy of History Unveiling Prophecy, and I'll send you a link to a PDF of it, or any of the books you uh, would like there. So, let's jump in. Um, last time, we left off on page 71 and chapter 8, the Edict of Nantes and English Revolution. <clears throat> Here we reach the beginning of the last act of the papal tragedy. Louis XIV sat on the throne of France at Versailles. At his side was Madame de Maintenon. Behind her stood the Jesuit confessor, Pierre Lachaise. Behind him again, the Pope, who gets his power from the dragon. In Piedmont, the trembling remnant of the of Protestants left by the Great Massacre of 1655 still clung to their native rocks and alpine fastness. In England, James II was struggling to restore papal supremacy and enslave the children of the Puritans who had bought their liberties at so great a price. Behind the scene, historically laid ages of darkness, before it ages of light. O oh, thou who wouldst draw near to behold the sight, the bush that burned with fire and was not consumed, take thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place on which thou standest is holy ground. Clear the way the mists of ignorance and hide the great tragedy from thine eyes. Thou art heir of freedom purchased by the sufferings and sacrifices of these martyr days. Gaze then upon the sublime and touching spectacle, and let it fix itself in thy memory forever. Fear not to enter this gloomy region, for light shall spring up from sepulchral darkness, life from the ashes of the dead. Hark, a wail bursts forth from the lips of thousands of Protestant parents robbed of their children. That wail is the prelude of the last great papal persecution of the Huguenots, a persecution which was followed by the French Revolution, inaugurating the modern era of civil and religious liberty. A terrible law strikes dismay into the hearts of fathers and mothers, a law that will bring us to the determination to go and cast ourselves at the feet of the king, begging him to grant us either death or freedom of conscience for us and for our children, or permission, leaving behind us our property, to forsake the nation and drag out a languishing existence scattered in every country of the globe. It is Pierre Giraud who utters this bitter cry in his last efforts of afflicted innocence, relating to the effects of the statute of Louis XIV of June 1681. And what was this law? It was a law which struck at the existence of family, which authorized the wholesale compulsory conversion of all children of the Protestants throughout France to the Roman Catholic Church. It authorized children of the tender age of seven years to renounce the religion of their Protestant parents and gave freedom to the Romish priests and population to ensnare them into an 
enforced confession of the Roman faith, a mere sentence, a word expressing admission of some popish doctrine sufficing, forbidding the poor innocents to take back its words, and thus tearing the child from its parents and its home, and hurrying it, in spite of frantic protests from the father and the mother, into some nunnery or other place, to be there immured until conversion was complete. A refinement of cruelty, this, unmatched even in the persecutions of old heathen Rome. Institutions sprung up at once all over France. Nouveau Catholics for boys, Nouvelles Catholics for girls. They are quickly crowded. Bereaved Protestant parents sit in their desolated homes, weeping over the children who have been torn away from them. All the torments that have heretofore been inflicted upon us are as nothing, they say, in comparison with this. It is, however, but the beginning of the tragedy. The parents are not yet converted. Unreasonable parents. The elder brothers and sisters still remain Protestants. They dare to hold prayer meetings in their desolated homes. They bow down on their knees and hide their weeping faces in their hands. They cry to the Father in heaven. What infamy! A stop must be put to this. But how? Had Satan ingenuity equal to the occasion? How were the parents and elder sons and daughters to be compelled to come wholesale into the Catholic fold? by a new method, by dragon aids. The army of Louis fourteen was vast and powerful, his soldiers unscrupulous, ungodly, superstitious, lustful, intolerant, ready instruments for arty ambition. Quarter the soldiers in the homes of the Protestants. Commission these booted evangelists to convert them, Give them leave to do as they will in these homes with the women, as well as the men, with the mothers and the daughters. Set them to work. Let them stable their horses in the parlors, break the furniture, devour the provisions, tie the father's hand and foot, and violate in their presence the wives and daughters. Let them prevent the wretched Huguenots from closing their eyes and sleep until they have renounced their Protestantism. Keep the heretics awake. Beat them. Drag them about. Shout at them. Walk them up and down the rooms all night long. And keep this fiendish treatment up day and night till they submit. Cursed heretics. What right have they to resist the will of Louis XIV? And the almighty Pope of Rome. And these horrors were done, done throughout all France. The soldiers quartered in the Protestants, pinched them, prodded them, hung them up by ropes, tormented them in a hundred other ways, until their unhappy victims scarcely knew what they were doing. They spat in the faces of women, made them lie down on burning coals, made them put their heads into ovens whose hot flames stifled them, the new mission went forward rapidly, Louis XIV directing from Grillon, Upper Languedoc, the Dragonades extended to saint Tonnage, Anis, Poteau on the west, and Vivarais on the east. Next came the turn of the province of Lyonnais, of the Sevenes, of Lower Languedoc, of province of Gex. Later, still, the rest of the kingdom became a prey to the hideous work of the booted mission, as it was called. Normandy, Burgundy, and the central provinces, even to far-off Brittany, and to Paris itself. The horrors the dragoons inspired, the crimes they perpetrated, the sufferings of the wretched victims. Who shall describe? But this was only the beginning of the tragedy. A statute still remained, the Edict of Nantes, protecting the lives and liberties of the Huguenots. By one fell stroke, this last 
protection was swept away. The edict was revoked. The floodgates were open, and persecution in its worst form rolled over the Protestant population of France. The fatal day of the revocation of the Edict of Nantes was the 17th of October, 1685. The first article of the new law recalled all legislation favorable to the Huguenots. The second forbade all gatherings of Protestants for the services of their religion. The three following had reference to Protestant ministers. All these were commanded to leave France within 15 days from the publication of the edict on pain of the galleys. The seventh article abolished all private schools for the instruction of Protestant children. The eighth prescribed that all children hereafter born of Protestant parents should be baptized by the parish priests and brought up in the Roman Catholic religion. Recalcitrant parents incurred a fine of 500 livres or more. In the tenth article, the king issued very express and repeated prohibitions to all his Protestant subjects against leaving his kingdom or allowing their wives or children to leave it and against exporting their goods and chattels. The penalty was the galleys for men, and confiscation of body and goods for women. All the Protestant churches throughout France were shut or pulled down. Nothing but ruins remain. The pastors were exiled, and the flocks forbidden to follow them. An entire people the best and noblest of the land, lay crushed under the cruel heel, the iron hoof of the relentless papal persecutor. Then followed the great exodus. Nothing could arrest it. Thousands on thousands of Huguenots fled from France. The frontiers were guarded in vain, disguised in all manners, manner of ways, their faces disfigured, their garments rent in the darkness of night, by sequestered paths, through forests, across mountains, and over the seas in open boats, they fled, and still fled, until half a million had escaped. They fled to Switzerland, to Holland, to England, and other countries. 400,000 perished in the effort to escape. The prisons were crowded, the homes of the Protestants emptied, their houses left tenantless. Thousands of Protestants had broken down under the strain and professed submission to their Roman Catholic persecutors. But the great mass of the Huguenots remained faithful. No power could conquer their convictions or compel them to deny their Lord. Chained to the oars in horrible galleys and brutally beaten and bastinadoed and bastinadoed by their captors they remained faithful crammed into filthy jails left to rotten dungeons they remained faithful broken on the wheel they remained faithful aged pastors lay bound in their by their limbs to that cruel instrument while through a long agony protracted sometimes for hours every bone in their body was broken Stroke followed stroke while life remained. Groans went up from the galleys, from the prisons, from the land of exile. In the Tower of Constance, Huguenot women were immured without hope of release. The walls were nearly 90 feet high and 18 feet in thickness. It contained two great circular vaulted chambers, one above the other, high and narrow loopholes admitted a feeble light. By that ray, one of the noble women, imprisoned there, rode on the wall, resist. Yes, they resisted unto blood. In that awful strife, who were the victors in that struggle? Louis XIV and the Pope and priests of Rome or the suffering Huguenots? Was not the crucified the conqueror was not the martyr the victor? So they overcame. When young Chamier went through his horrible torture, for the scene of which, by a refinement of cruelty, 
the street in front of his paternal home had been selected, it was his mother that chiefly urged him to fortitude in suffering for the faith. I have yet, she said, three children whom I shall cheerfully give up if they be called to die for religion's sake. Like the noble martyrs of primitive times, they loved not their lives unto the death. They overcame, for greater is he who was in them than he who was in the opposing world. Rome believed and boasted that she had triumphed. She rang her joy bells. She struck commemoration medals. On one of them, the crowned monarch stands on the steps of the altar and extends to France, represented by a kneeling suppliant, the scepter of his mercy, while around are inscribed the words, Sacra Romana Restituta, the Roman religion restored. The Queen of Sweden received and sheltered some of the refugees. I pray with all my heart, she says, that the false joy and triumph of the church may not some day cost her tears and sorrow. What did, what it did cost France, history has since related. In the Vaudois Valleys, at this time, at this same period, the wave of persecution had reached its highest altitude. In thy book, cried Milton, record their groans, who were thy sheep, and in their ancient fold, slain by the bloody, sta- slain by the bloody Piedmontese that rolled, mother with infants down the rocks, their groans, the veils redoubled to the hills, and they to heaven. The Vaudois Protestants were cut up alive, roasted over fires, impaled on stakes, disemboweled, torn limb from limb, tortured in ways too horrible to describe. Ledger's volume contains pictures of all these horrors and gives the names and numbers of the sufferers. In 1686, Louis XIV sent 14,000 men under the Marquis de Catanet to join the Piedmont army to enforce, to enforce the submission of the Vaudois. Following his victory over the Protestants in the valleys, Protestants of the valleys, the Duke condemned 14,000 of them to the prison of Turin. Of these, 11,000 perished by heat, cold, hunger, and thirst in their imprisonment. The remaining 3,000 on emancipation from the prison, fled over the mountains to Switzerland and Brandenburg. The Republic of Geneva extended to the exiles a touching welcome. In England, James too had opened negotiations with the Pope. Papists were in full patronage, and Jeffreys was holding his bloody assizes. In the army, Protestant officers were replaced by Romanists. The papal nuncio, was received at Windsor, and the seven bishops sent to the tower, the people venting their feelings in tears and prayers. A storm was brewing, and a dark cloud hung over the land. The closing crisis of papal persecution had long been expected. Students of prophecy in the days of the Reformation and of the Puritan Revolution had forecast its advent and sought to calculate the period of its occurrence. They knew that the Protestant religion would be suppressed in some unprecedented way before the final judgments of God were poured forth on their persecutors. They believed that the Protestant witnesses were yet to be slain, that they were to lie unburied for three and a half years, and then to be raised from the dead and exalted to power and supremacy. Peter Giraud, One of the exiled Huguenot ministers wrote in a book in 1687, a copy of which lies before us, entitled, The Accomplishment of the Scripture Prophecies on the Approaching Deliverance of the Church, proving that the present persecution may end in three years and a half, after which the destruction of the Antichrist shall begin, which shall be finished in the beginning of the next age, 
and then the kingdom of Christ shall come upon the earth. It's a long title, isn't it? It is a volume of 600 pages and remarkable for the clearness and force of its argument. Was Giraud mistaken? The revocation of the Edict of Nantes took place on the 17th of October, 1685. The, the English Revolution followed in 1688. And on the coronation of William of Orange and Queen Mary took place on the 11th of April, 1689. From October 1685 to April 1689, the interval is three and a half years. The English Revolution marked the end of papal supremacy in England and papal persecution on any, any wildly and papal persecution on any widely extended scale in the world. It was the first stage in the inauguration of a new era. You're listening to Cross the Border, and we're going through uh, history, unveiling prophecy, or time as an interpreter by H. Grattan Guineas. This historical witness of God's people, uh, their persecutions, their protests, uh, should not be stifled, but it has been stifled. This history has been hidden from the view of the modern church. And over the generations, the Counter-Reformation Army of the great whore, the papal whore of the Roman church, has done its job very well. We have an entire generation that have never even heard of the true historical and biblical Antichrist. They never heard of the persecutions. They don't even know who the Vaudois, the Huguenots, the Waldenses, the Albigenses, all of these people that suffered by the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands for their faith were put to death by the Antichrist, all hidden from view. And they've been sold a lie called futurism. A lie, a seven-year tribulation deception based upon another lie. They've changed God's word. We'll be back in a few minutes and we will continue with more of this forgotten history. Don't go anywhere. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, -S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn, the Jewish people are eager, most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border 
crossthborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crossthborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossthborder.org. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host cause and anywhere else the spirit may lead you do all to the glory of our god and creator for his holy nation the only kingdom that will last forever thank you for listening Welcome back. You're listening to Cross the Border, and this is our Prophecy Reality Edition, and we're taking advantage of the time here to go through uh, History Unveiling Prophecy, or time as an interpreter, um, opening our ears to the witness of history and the witness of God's people through history, to realization of who the biblical and historical Antichrist was and still is. We left off on, let's see, where did we leave off? On page 75, if you're following along in our PDF version there. And uh, I'm going to pick up right there. Get this on the screen. The English Revolution marked the end of papal supremacy in England and papal persecution on any widely extended scale in the world. It was the first stage in the inauguration of a new era. In 1688, James II, the last popish king of England, abandoned his throne and fled. The victories of William of Orange in Ireland and on the continent followed, including those of Marlborough over the armies of Louis XIV in the Nine Years' War with France, from May 1689 to January 1697, the almost unexampled series of English victories of, the, of this war was succeeded by the Treaty of Ryswick in September 1697 and the full establishment of civil and religious liberty. Encouraged by the English Revolution in 1689, the Vaudois refugees in Switzerland resolved to attempt to return to their country about the 16th of August, 1689. Long and grueling was their journey before they descended into the valley of Pragella, the most northern valley, the most northern of the Vaudois valleys. In this long and perilous journey across the Alps, they were led by Henry Arnaud, though opposed by 10,000 French and 12,000 Piedmontese they cut their way through, losing only 30 of their number in their numerous encounters 
with their enemies, climbing the precipitous Alps, crossing the snows, sleeping on bare ground, subsisting only on bread and herbs, they escaped or put flight, or put to flight their foes, preserved by a miracle from all the perils of the way. Their return to the native valleys celebrated as La Rentri Glorios was effected three and a half years after their total dis dissipation. We have said that Giraud published a work on the approaching deliverance of the church in 1687, in which he anticipated that the restoration of Protestantism would follow three and a half years after its overthrow at the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685. Another work on the Revelation, written in 1685 by an exiled French minister, contains the same anticipation. Copies of both of these works are lying before us, the original author. The latter contains the following reference to its authorship on the title page, written by a French minister in the year 1685 and finished but two days before the dragoons plundered him of all except this treatise, a small volume of about 300 pages, fallen to pieces with age, with broken binding and separated leaves. My copy is tied together with string to preserve it from destruction, an eloquent witness to the last papal persecution and the anticipation based upon the sure word of prophecy of the speedy restoration of Protestant liberties. The author tells us that he was unacquainted with Giraud's view when he wrote it. There were device, there were divers of the refugees, he says, who had the sight of this discourse when they were in France for the author had finished it near the end of August 1685, about two days before the arrival of the new missionaries, the dragoons who plundered him of all he had, so that this was the whole that he was able to save out of that doleful shipwreck, which since his arrival at a place of security he hath reviewed and corrected in several places, and having met with the accomplishment of the prophecies, written by the famous Monsieur Giraud, the author was exceedingly pleased to find that he ex had explained the 11th chapter of Revelation as a promissory of the reestablishment of the Reformed in France, according as that great man hath done, not in France, however, but chiefly in England, whither great numbers of the refugees had come, and in the Waldensian valleys was the restoration of Protestantism to be effected. It came at the expected time. A darker experience waited France. The execution of terrible judgments in retribution for her cruel and long-continued persecution of the Huguenots, regarded in its widest aspects, the English Revolution under William of Orange marked the commencement of the modern era of full Protestant liberties and the political ascendancy of Protestant power in Europe and throughout the world. And that's the end of chapter 8. We move on to uh, chapter 9, the 18th century era. Following the establishment of Protestantism in the Revolution of 1688, came the expansion of England, the rise of America, a great revival of religion, and the dawn of modern worldwide missions. The siege and heroic defense of Londonderry, the Battle of Bion, and the victories of Marlborough marked the termination of the struggle led by William of Orange against the papal foe. On the 15th of September, 1697, William signed the Peace of Ryswick, a peace between Great Britain, the United Provinces, France, Spain, and the Emperor Leopold I. Under this treaty, concluding the Nine Years' War with France, Louis XIV acknowledged the Prince of Orange as King of Great Britain, without condition or reserve. Strasbourg was restored to the Empire, Luxembourg to the Spaniards, 
together with other places taken by the French since the Treaty of Nemegen, and all places in the Low Country taken by France were abandoned, concluded on as fair terms as England could exact, this pacification, as far as the prospects of the continent were concerned, was but a preliminary armistice of vigilance and preparation. In England, however, the effect was of a more important character and signalized the commencement of a new era of full civil and religious liberty. On his return to England, William appointed the 2nd of December, 1697, a day of solemn thanksgiving for the conclusion of the general peace. On that day, the Cathedral of St. Paul's, the magnificent work of Sir Christopher Wren, was first opened to the public. The period, of the, the period thus inaugurated had, has seen the expansion of England to worldwide dimensions. Wars with France in the 18th century. The great English Navy, says Seeley, took play, first took definite shape in the wars of the Commonwealth and the English Army, founded on the Mutiny Bill, dates from the reign of William III, between the Revolution and the Battle of Waterloo. It may be reckoned that we waged and won seven great wars, of which the shortest lasted seven years, and the longest about twelve. Out of a hundred and twenty-six years, sixty-four years, or more than half, were spent at war. Let us pass these wars in review. There was first the European War in which England was involved by the Revolution of 1688. It is pretty well remembered, since the story of it has been told by Macaulay. It lasted eight years, from 1689 to 1697. Then there was the Great War, called the Spanish Secession, which we shall always remember because it was the War of Marlborough's victories. It lasted 11 years, from 1702 to 1713. The next Great War has now passed almost entirely out of memory, not having brought to light any very great commander nor achieved any definite result. This war lasted nine years, from 1739 to 1748. Next comes the Seven Years' War, in which we have not forgotten the victories of Frederick. In the English part of it, we all remember one grand incident, the Battle of the Heights of Abraham, the death of Wolfe, and the conquest of Canada. And yet, in the, in the case of this war, also it may be observed how much the 18th century has faded out of our imaginations. We have quite forgotten that that victory was one of a long series, which to contemporaries seems fabulous, but that the nation came out of the struggle intoxicated with glory, and England stood upon a pinnacle of greatness which she had never reached before. This is the Fourth War. It is in sharp contrast with the Fifth, which we have tacitly agreed to mention as seldom as we can. What we call the American War, which from the first outbreak of hostilities to the Peace of Paris lasted eight years, from 1775 to 1783, was ended ignominiously enough in America, but in its latter part spread into a grand naval war in which England stood at bay against almost all the world, and in this, through the victories of Rodney, came off with some credit. The sixth and seventh of the two great wars, with revolutionary France, which we are not likely to forget, though we ought to keep them more separate in our minds than we do, the first lasted nine years, from 1793 to 1802, the second 12 years from 1803 to 1815. Now it has occurred to few of us to connect these wars together or to look for any unity or plan or purpose pervading them. But look a little closer. Out of these seven wars of England, five are wars with France from the beginning, and both the other two, though the belligerent at the outset was first Spain 
and in the second one of our colonies, yet became in a short time and ended as wars with France. I say these wars made one grand decisive struggle between England and France on the continent in Canada and in India. England overcame the armies of France. England, as a result, became a great world power. The expansion of England in the New World and in Asia is the formula which sums up for England the history of the 18th century. The next great feature of this period is 1. The rise of the United States of America. The Puritans, who after a warfare against arbitrary power in England, subverted the monarchy and overturned the church, laid in America the foundation of the most mighty republic the world has ever known. Exiled from England during the reign of Mary, the Puritans returned on the accession of Elizabeth, bent upon the great design of extirpating from the constitution of the church what they deemed the last degrading vestiges of popery, and remodeling it after the doctrines and practices of the continental reformers. Now commenced a stern and unrelenting struggle. The high church party resolved to admit no compromise. The Puritans, on the other hand, exposed to the utmost rage of persecution, could only oppose it in an indomitable firmness and tenacity. The Puritan ministers, ejected from their livings, driven from their pulpits and their homes, began to travel the country and disseminate their views by preaching and issuing pamphlets in defiance of fine and imprisonment. When James I came to the throne, the Puritans lost no time in presenting to the king a petition signed by 825 ministers praying for the removal of superstitious usages and other abuses which deformed the church. The celebrated Hampton Court Conference was the reply, a conference in which James I browbeat the unfortunate Puritan ministers in the coarsest manner, encouraged by the sycophant sycophantic smiles of the prelates and courtiers, if, said he, you may aim at Scottish, at a Scottish presbytery, it agrees as well with monarchy as God with the devil. I will none of that. I will have one doctrine and one discipline. Rising from his chair, he added, I shall make them conform themselves, or I will harry them out of the land, or yet do worse. Denied the religious liberty they sought in England, many of the Puritans fled to Holland and from that country made their way to America. Their voyage in the Mayflower marked the commencement of a mighty development of civil and religious freedom existing in America today. After tossing on the Atlantic in their small crowded vessel for more than two months, the pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock on the 25th of December, 1620. Here, the low sand hills of Cape Cod, covered with scrubby woods that descended to the sea, seemed at first glance a perfect paradise of verdure to the poor sea-beat wanderers. Before entering the harbor, they subscribed their names to a covenant in which they stated that, having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith, at honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern part of Virginia, we do solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and of one another covenant and combine ourselves together in, into it civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and by virtue hereof to enact, constitute and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time as shall be thought to meet and convenient for both the general good of the colony into which we promise all due submission and obedience. American writers have denominated this voluntary agreement the birth of popular constitutional liberty, and though it was no intention of the pilgrims to cast off subjection to England, they did practically 
by giving every man the right of voting and choosing officers to draw up and carry out the laws of the colony lay the foundation of a totally new system of government upon the basis of a democratic equality and practical independence over which the nominal sway of a distant power could never exert any efficient permanent control. A further settlement of Puritan pilgrims in Massachusetts in the time of Charles I formed a latter stage in the planting of American colonization. Like the pilgrims of 1620, these had been driven forth from their native country by the intolerable burdens of enforced conformity. But the Puritan settlers had not completely shaken off the spirit of intolerance from which they had suffered, pronouncing the principle that the civil magistrate had no right of control in the sacred sphere of conscience. Roger Williams was banished from the colony, driven forth in the depths of winter under storms more fierce than those assailed that assailed the Pilgrim Fathers when they landed from the Mayflower. He had to skulk for many weeks amid the intricate wilds of the leafless forest, glad when he discovered a hollow tree to shelter him from the pitiless blasts of the north wind laden with ice and snow. But the ravens, he said, fed me in the wilderness. The wild Indians protected the outcast, and through his long life he never forgot the debt of gratitude. Williams removed at length to Rhode Island. Five companions who shared with him the large views of liberty for which he had endured these sufferings followed him thither. And there, with the advice of the benevolent governor of Boston, that and beyond the reach of the charter of Massachusetts, the pioneer of liberty founded a new settlement to which he gave the name of Providence. Thus was planted that sapling which has since grown into the mighty tree of the United States of America. The American Declaration of Independence in 1776 marks one of the most important stages in the new era of civil and religious liberty which broke on the world at the commencement of the 18th century. The hand of a higher power is seen, is here seen, guiding events to nobler issues that had been contemplated by even the best of men. From the Pilgrims of the Mayflower to Roger Williams, from Roger Williams to Washington, the path exhibits a continuous ascent to the loth, lofty level of freedom attained by the American people. The discovery of the new world was the prelude. The discovery of the new world was a prelude to the Reformation and the completion of the edifice of civil and religious liberties in the new world has been the crown of the new era inaugurated by the doctrines of the reformers and the deeds of the Puritans. And I would say amen to that. Two. We don't have time for two. So we're going to pick up right there the 18th century revival in American England when we come back next week. You're listening to Cross the Border. It's our Prophecy Reality Edition. My name is Nicholas. And I'm going to ask you to please go to my website and subscribe there and share my blog with other people. And uh, we, uh, we work here very hard behind the scenes. Um, I would say we at least put in 60 hour weeks here. What would you say? 60 hours? <laughs> at, least. at least. Yes. So we're, there's no slackers in God's kingdom. I'm going to tell you that right up front. When you, when you accept uh, God as your boss and you decide to work for him, uh, well, there are no slackers and there's no end to the work that can be done in God's kingdom. So if the Almighty asks you to add your labor to ours by supporting that the work that we do here, then uh, please be obedient to him and because uh, we do need your support. Okay, uh, what else? I guess that's it. I'm going to leave you with that and with a prayer that each and every one of you uh, repent. Cross the border into God's kingdom and live forever. There's absolutely nothing more important than that. May the Almighty bless you and keep you as you 
walk daily in his kingdom on the narrow way. Thank you for listening. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host cause and anywhere else the spirit may lead you do all to the glory of our god and creator for his holy nation the only kingdom that will last forever thank you for listening